question on the temperature around the things. I think we're going to get too cold. Um, so I thought we'd have to do the ventilation protection and keep it warm at the same time, which is not easy. Um, so bear with us. Okay, um, just a few things to mention this morning. First of all, um, hopefully you saw the email last night um, saying please do wear masks uh, during the um, time you're in here. I know I'm not wearing mine at the minute, but um, uh, just to protect those around us that are perhaps a bit more vulnerable with the light of the, the new government's uh, recommendations. Um, the church members meeting is on the 8th of December, so that's a week on Wednesday. Hopefully it'll be here, uh, as long as nothing dramatic has changed since uh, before then. Uh, it will include a special element of a special church members meeting to discuss uh, the um, perspectives that came to leave with us last week and discuss the next steps for that. We'll also include Deacon's elections, and we've had four nominations. We've had Christine, Dan, Ian, and Moji. So if you can please pray for those four people and pray um, on your own voting decision on, on those as well. Um, and finally, uh, the Wednesday morning prayer meeting is actually meeting in person in the lounge at 9 o'clock this Wednesday. It's the first Wednesday of the month. Uh, so please come on to that if you can. With that, I'll turn over to David. Hello, John.
that as we worship God. Prayed for me. 
And I expected, I thought all was going well, I'd be the dentist on Monday morning having my tooth sorted out. When I heard that at 8 o'clock on Monday morning, the dentist's receptionist said, sorry, we haven't got any vacancies, even for emergency treatment. So I thought, so much for prayer. <laughs> You know, I do have thoughts like that, I do have thoughts like that sometimes. Um, but then it turned out what would be that? Because I went Tuesday morning, I had to be there for 8.15. I thought they were going to have to take the tooth out because that's what he threatened me with last time. He said, if that comes again, but he decided to do it. So I've still got the rest of my tooth that I had before. So, there was a prayer for forces to 11 on Wednesday morning from the Lord. It didn't turn out like I wanted it, but it did turn out that God heard our prayers and answered. And so I wondered how many of you who were here last week and had prayer from somebody you were sharing with about your quarter to 11 on Monday morning would be able to recognize that God heard that prayer and answered it. And bless you. Maybe not in the same, you know, maybe not the way you expected, but the way God chose to do it. So I put in my hand, who would join me in saying, yes, I can see that God answered the prayer? Anybody else? Just two of us? Three, Eli, four, and two, Eli. Well, that's good, isn't it? And so, uh, that's good. If there's uh, somebody else who's wanted to this morning has something they'd like us to give thanks to God for, please indicate and I'll try and get to somewhere near you. Where are you from? Remember where I put it. Anybody want to give thanks to God? I'm going to try get me a beeline. You have to try to get me a mask. Here she is. Yeah, that's a, it takes a good woman to do that. We bless you that you are the God who answers our prayer. And we're going to sing from the blue book, number 17, which is Bless the Lord, O my soul. We're only going to sing the first two verses of which you know we should. But this says there's you know, 10,000 reasons why we should give thanks to God.
thank you for the evidence in Eli's prayer that many things that are said go deep within. And we pray that you bless him and all the children as they go to their own learning places. We commit them to you as we ask your presence with us too. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So the children go to their various classes and that would be great. During Advent, we're going to be focusing on John the Baptist as our kind of guiding light to lead us to Jesus. And so to, this morning we're starting with one of the first references to him, and that's in Luke chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 5 to 18. In the time of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations for laborers. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren. And they were both well off. Once when Zachariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshippers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zachariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. The angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zachariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and delight to you. Many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. Never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will bring, he will he bring back to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zachariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I'm an old man, and my wife is well on in years. So, we're going to be following through this theme of here he comes, because that's kind of colloquial translation of the word advent. It's about coming. And it says, here he comes, but who's the he? Well, that's part of the mystery of this preparation that we call Advent. Is the he John the Baptist? Is the he Jesus? Is the he God? Or is it someone else? Who is it who's coming? We are preparing for during the time of Advent. Now, I was reading an article in the paper about Advent yesterday, and it said, in this quite long article, that actually we are not very good at delayed gratification. If you don't know what delayed gratification is, ask Roger, he'll explain it best for me. Uh, but it means we're not very good at putting off what we want to have. So, you know, we want to have presents, so we go and buy them now to make sure we've got them, won't we? That's a very sensible thing shops might run out. Hopefully if you've gone for your turkey you will delay your gratification till Christmas Day, otherwise you might go hungry. But that's it. That putting off something we want so we can have it at the right time. Maybe we've got to save up for it. But we're not good at that. We want it now, now, now. We're the instant generation. And this article was saying because of that we miss out on so much. Because it's actually sometimes like delaying and preparing that we appreciate things most. 
Now, we have a wonderful Christmas tree, and we're very grateful to those who put it up for us. No, don't misunderstand it. But technically, we shouldn't have the Christmas tree up. You shouldn't have it up in your house either until Christmas Eve. But we're not very good at delaying gratification. And if I said, made the deacon say, we're not having a Christmas tree till Christmas Eve, I don't think it'd be very pleased with me, would you? But there is value in preparing properly for something important to happen. And that's what Luke is doing for us as he takes us through the preparation for the birth of John the Baptist. And he begins by saying, in the time of Herod, king of Judea. I forgot the way this goes. That's it. So, we're going to be looking at this growing sense of excitement that begins when Luke says, in the time of Herod, king of Judea. Now, Herod had been king for a long time. 40 years. Now, if you've got a benign monarch like we have, you're quite glad that she keeps going, aren't you? Because you think, well, I wonder if the next ones will be as good as she was. <coughs> Obviously, uh, she was breathing, that's fine. <laughs> um, but Herod was a horrible man. He was violent, he was brutal, he was callous, he didn't mind killing people, he didn't mind how many people he killed. So although his story in place called him Herod the Great, most of the people under his rule didn't like him at all. They didn't think he was great. The only thing they liked him for if they were Jews was that he set about rebuilding the temple properly. But he hadn't finished it when he died. It was taken a long, long time to do. Um, maybe like HS2. Um, we'll see. But anyway, uh, Herod was known as Herod the Great. But Luke mentions it because he's writing for this person a long, long way away from the Oculus who was probably a very educated Roman old Greek. So he wants him to know what's, whereabouts, the place, what he's going to describe. But really what he wants to do is tell us and share with us and build our sense of excitement. So having mentioned Herod the Great, he then goes on to say there was a priest named Zachariah. And uh, in some ways that's, that, 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 that's a bit of a downfall, you see, because Zachariah was uh, a nobody. There were roughly eight or nine thousand priests at the time. And uh, Zachariah belonged to one of the divisions. There were 24 divisions, not like football divisions, so I think there might be the only 24 divisions if you go all over the country for that. But there were divisions, and in each division of these priests, there were about 800, 900 priests. There were a lot of priests around, but actually there was a lot of stuff to do in the temple. And each of these divisions had a week at the beginning of the year, a week later on in the year, when they would actually go and perform the critical ceremonies in the temple. Now you could be a priest for many, many years, and you never ever got the opportunity to do the really important things in the temple, just to ensure the sacrifice was properly presented, to God and then go into the temple and burn the incense that was showing that all of the people's longings, all of their prayers for forgiveness, all of their thanks to God in the offering were going to God. And Zachariah was an old man. Twice a year he hoped that on one of the seven days when his division was looking after the ceremonies, he might be the one chosen. And he got up year after year after year, 30, 40, maybe even 50 years. And it was all somebody else's turn. Always it was somebody else who was chosen by a lot of people. Yes, it's me! I'm going to be doing the most important job for our people that it's possible to imagine to honor the sacrifice and to burn the incense in the Holy of Holies. And every time when Zachariah saw someone else's excitement, his heart, it's not me again. 
The loop wants us to catch the excitement because at long, long last, after years of waiting and living faithfully and serving God day in and day out, because you didn't only serve God in the temple, you served him back in your village where you dealt with all the uncleanness laws and you taught people the law. It's a busy life and he's done it faithfully. And now, at long last, he was chosen. supervised the, the sacrifice being prepared and burnt and then went into the temple. And in the Holy of Holies, the very sacred part where very few people ever went to see while he was there, he would have uttered a prayer. And this is what he would say. He would say, God, appoint peace, goodness, and blessing. Grace, mercy, Passion for us and for all Israel, your people. Blessed be you, Jehovah, who blesses your people with peace. So he was going in there, the incense was being offered on the altar, on the burning coals, it would go up to God, and he would have said that. He was so, so excited. And Luke wants us to feel. His excitement, and that's why he builds up this process. And then, when he is very excited, something happens. And now he's not excited, he's scared to death. But our excitement rises because an angel has appeared in the Holy of Holies. What's going to happen next? Can you catch the excitement that Luke is building for us? When Zachariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zachariah. Of course you're afraid if an angel appears. Especially if he appears in the Holy of Holies. Because you think, now what have I done? Is God going to strike me down? Is that why he sent his angel to, to, to kill me? What have I done? So the angel tries to reassure him. He comes with a message or two. And the first message really is a huge surprise. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. Now we've learned that Zachariah and his wife are both very elderly. There is no chance that she can have a child, let alone be promised a son. In her early years, she was uh, the talk behind her back of all the women in the village because she would be despised that she didn't have any children. And all her life, alongside Zachariah, they have carried this burden of childlessness. And then when he's completely overwhelmed, first with excitement and now with fear, an angel comes with this unbelievable news that his wife is going to get pregnant. It's tough. But for us, it's exciting because if there's a child about to be born that's special, God must be on the moon. You see, similar things happened to Abraham and Sarah when he was even older than Zachariah. He was approaching a hundred. And angels appeared and said, you're going to have a son. And he did. His name was Isaac. And this son was full of promise because God said, through him, I'm going to bless all the nations of the world. And a bit later on, at the end, towards the end of the time of Judges, there was another couple, and they were promised they were going to have a son. His name, it was Samson. And they were told he was going to be very special. And then a bit later still, there was another childless lady who felt completely undermined because she couldn't have a child. And she was in the temple. She was praying to God. But the priest there just thought she was drunk because she was muttering away. And in those days, you didn't pray silently. You always it. And he said, go away, you drunken woman. And she said, don't say that. I'm praying to God that he would give me 
a child and she did as her name was come. So you see, there are lots of times in the Old Testament that whenever a child is born in a special way, announced by an angel to people who are no longer fertile, or to a woman who's desperately praying as Zachariah and Elizabeth have done for decades. Whenever that is happening, God is on the move. So get excited, because God is about to do something wonderful. And what's even more special is what he's told about this child. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. He will be a joy and delight. Of course he will. It's their firstborn son when they had never expected. He's never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from the See, if someone is filled with God's Spirit, even from birth, God is about to do something incredible. When you get home, turn to uh, Judges. To Judges chapter 13. This is the story of the announcement of the fact that Samson was going to be born. A certain man named Zora, named Manoah from the clan of that night, had a wife who was sterile and remained childless. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, But what is even more important is not only that she had, became pregnant, gave birth to a son, he grew and the Lord blessed him, and the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him while he was young. John the Baptist is going to be filled with the Spirit even from birth. Amazing. What is God going to do? But when it says many will rejoice because of his birth, it's not just only at his birth, it's because he's been born. Because he's going to do amazing things for God. His real mission is to bring people back to God, to call them to repent. His mission is to prepare a people to be ready for God. And so every step that Luke takes us on this journey through the story of what the angel has to say to Zachariah, every step is a step where there is romantic excitement. And I want us to catch the excitement that Zachariah must have felt, and then Elizabeth must have felt when she became pregnant. Because this is not just a birth, it's about God being on the moon. God is going to do something wonderful at the very point where his people felt there was no hope because Herod the Great was still on the throne, still holding them down, and because there did nothing happen for 400 years. 400 years. Now, when you're a child, 40 days waiting for Christmas seems forever. Or if you're a parent with children pestering you, it seems forever. I'm told by the time you get older, 80, 40 years is just a flash for the back of your mind. I can tell you about that. But of course, if you're a geologist, 40 years is not 400 years is not. And if you're an astrophysicist, 400,000 years is just the least in the aisles listening. Brian Cox talking about the Milky Way and how one galaxy has collided into another. It took a billion years for them to assimilate one another. A billion years. What's 400,000 years matter? But we need to take our time to prepare for God because something wonderful happens. Elizabeth is coming. 
of all. What difference does it make? It made a big difference to them, of course. It made a big difference to God's people. But what about us? The first thing I think we need to know is that we should never give up expecting where God's concerned. Most of us have seen quite a few Christmases. We've probably seen nearly as many, some nearly as many carols as uh, Zachariah had performed help perform things of the temple. But never give up <coughs> This is another time where we celebrate again the incredible news that God has not turned his back on our world, but has come to live among us, to share his very nature, to bring us his salvation, to enwrap us in his love. And Christmas is the time when we get ready to celebrate that. I know you've always sent Christmas cards. Maybe you still do. But never let what you do every year stop you or me getting excited. Because God is doing everything. And you may have prayed for your friends for a long, long time that they might discover Jesus. Never give up expecting that they might. Renew your prayers for them, for your family, for your neighbours, for your friends, that God might burst into their lives as he burst into his people's life through the birth of John the Baptist. Keep expecting. And secondly, keep on being faithful. One of the amazing things we told about Zachariah and Elizabeth is that they obeyed the commandments, they kept on praying, and they were righteous before God. It's easy to give up, isn't it? When we don't get the responses we want straight away. Some dark times I'm tempted to give up praying for my son who's still struggling with long COVID. And had it very early on. I've been praying for days, weeks, months, now into years. But I won't give up. Because God is a God who answers prayer. Sometimes it takes a long while. Jesus didn't say just knock on the door once. What he says is keep on knocking and it will be given to you. And so I plead with you at this time of Advent, as we're preparing for Christmas, for the coming of God into our world, keep expecting and keep being faithful. Do what you need to do. Pray, pray, pray. Serve, serve, serve. Never give up on the hopes that God has put in your heart for you, your family. Keep praying. Keep serving. Keep looking to God because of everything else. God is faithful. God always sees, but he's always at work. We can't always recognize how he's working his purposes out, but he's at the job. Even now, he's working for you and for me and for our church and for our community and for our country and for our world. He never stops. And from time to time, we see him as we see all his preparation coming to fruition. And it's wonderful when we do. So, as we prepare for Christmas, as we follow the story of John the Baptist, as we begun with him today, the announcement of his birth, and all that Luke was trying to get across to us, let God's Spirit excite you once more. Because he's a God who's on the moon. Keep expecting. Keep Faithful. And above all, know that God is the faithful one. We're going to sing number 123 as we prepare to move to communion. One thing I ask that I may dwell in your house, O Lord. One thing I desire is to see you.
the, the community prayer that Paul encourages is Maranatha. Maranatha was an Aramaic word, so we know it's right back to the very, very earliest time of the church. And it says, come Lord. We join with God's people from the Old Testament. We join with Zachariah and Elizabeth. We join with all of his people through the last 2,000 years and we say, come Lord Jesus. Come. We, we thank you that you came for Christmas. We thank you that you came and died on the cross and rose again. We thank you that as we share in this simple meal of bread and wine, as those who believe in Jesus, so you come to us again. That we can with us that same expectation that Zachariah had when he went to the temple, and that even greater excitement and anticipation when John eventually was born. Come. Catherine is going to lead us in a prayer as we give thanks for the bread and the wine. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your love and for your faithfulness to us. As we take part in this remembrance, we thank you for sending Jesus. We thank you that he paid the price for us so that we can have a relationship with you. His body was broken that we may be healed and restored. His blood was shed that we might be forgiven. Please forgive us and cleanse us. Fill us with your spirit so that we might please you and serve you daily. Amen. Paul also said that as we gather around this table, we should examine ourselves. So, just to take a moment. Will allow God's Spirit to search your heart so you can seek for His forgiveness for the things you know that you've done wrong, but also for the things you fail to do right. So the Lord Jesus, on the night when He was being betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body. Broken, but broken. When they had finished eating, Jesus took the cup. It was one of several cups that were passed around at the Passover meal. And he said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant, the new relationship that God is making with his people, the new covenant. It is for many, for the forgiveness of sins. All of you bring God. And so we will give the cups to you. We ask you to wait so that we can drink together.
Now on the screen, you can see a loaf of bread and the cup. And in the cup, there is red wine. If we had the BBC word for us, we could kind of go into that red wine. We could go backwards. We could see the way it had been crushed, the grapes as they had grown on the vine how the vine had been planted and the roots had extended and nourished it. We could, we could take a journey to explore how that red wine came to be. But as Christians, with God's Spirit, we can go on another journey into that cup. We, we can see the red wine. And then we can see the lifeblood of Jesus being poured out for us, sacrificed on the cross. And we can go back further into the very heart of God. And as we travel back, we begin to just see the vastness, the riches, the wonder, the incredible love that God has for each of us, that is made available to us not just in a glass, but through his son. And Jesus said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant. It's for the forgiveness of sin. All of you. say many years later, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so we come to pray for our broken world. Father, we've seen many things on the television that have made us deeply sad in this last week. We've seen hundreds, thousands of people trapped Poland and Belarus, people who made, made terrible journeys to escape from even more terrible situations, and now they're stuck in the cold and the wet and the misery. We've seen those other terrible images of refugees in Calais and of the, all those who lost their lives as they sought to gain freedom and fulfill their hopes. Father, we want to say to you how sad it makes us feel that we, your people, and the people of your world can allow such terrible things to happen and we do not know how to stop them. In our powerlessness, we cry to you and say, Father, forgive us. Grant wisdom to those who have to take political decisions. Grant compassion to those who have to implement them. And for all those in our country, not only in Kent, but every council throughout the country who are seeking to welcome those refugees and asylum seekers, pray that you will give them patience and perseverance. And we pray especially for Christians working in, with and with the council to help solve these dreadful problems and bring life and hope to these people who suffer so much. Lord, we bring our prayers to you. And we bring our prayers to you for our own church. We pray for all those who feel trapped in their homes, for all those who are coping with illness, either themselves or in their family or neighborhood networks. We pray that you would help us never to lose heart, never to lose faith, never to stop looking to you. And we pray that through all the glitter of Christmas, 
we might be people who can shine your light of love and hope and cleansing in our neighborhood and in our world. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We move towards the close of our service as we sing only by grace. Thank you. 